Okay, we'll start again. So what are the origins of HR? HR started as a U.S. initiative in the U.S. where they were trying to find ways to reduce the main organization more efficient, where they had a challenging economic time, um, time period. And uh, if you know the Industrial Revolution, where things, you had these big production chains and thousands of workers worked in the production, um, production companies. Cars were very manual. That's how cars were produced. You know, people, uh, people just put non different parts in this sequence of activities to make a car. No, it's very computerized. You know? um, cars are made by computers now, and maybe workers might just do the finishing touches. So you came from this big industrial or uh, modernizing age, becoming a little more sophisticated with technology. So what's the challenge as you come from a very manual age where um, a lot of work is done by manual labor and many, many workers doing specialized tasks. So as you become more modern, what's going to be the challenge? Resistance to change and who's going to be part of the resistance? Workers and their representatives, unions. So you started getting these clashes between the unions saying that you're taking away the work from workers but in reality, technology will continue to move at a pace. Um, so it was a time in the US where they wanted to seriously look at ways of improving the, um, the work that was done. Coming in the 50s, and uh, but it's only back in the 80s, people, maybe academics, started looking at it very, very seriously. So it's around for, for quite a while, the concept of HRM. But of course, before that, workers worked in organizations. So you would have the, the, what is still used the term labor management relationships, industrial relationships where unions represented workers and defended the rights of workers. So there's more what we call industrial relations, right? Or labor relations. So that's why when HRM started to become big, a lot of unions opposed HRM practices, but they saw HRM as anti-union. So in fact, there was actually what was called an anti-union movement in the US coming in back in the 18s too, and even in the UK. So they accused Margaret Thatcher from the UK, the, the Prime Minister at that time, of being union breakers, right? Or union busters. So what they actually, they started putting measures in place to weaken the power of unions. And uh, so that antagonism continued maybe up to today, where you have the workers, the labor, the workers' representatives, the unions, and the HRM tended to be um, really contentious and having conflicts between the two. And then we had, in the UK, again, coming on board more in the late 1980s, moving, and that's where you, you so prior to this, you would have had personnel managers, right? The old personnel system, personnel managers, a lot of um, record keeping, administration, um, so you had your old personal management system. So now you start to hear coming in the 80s, the language of the human resource manager, the human resource officer, the human resource director, that tended to now look internally for the organization to gain better control of workers, to get them to be more efficient, to get them to be better partners, to see management more as an ally and not as an enemy. And I look at a philosophical position um, that existed and the sociologist spoke about it, where you had unitarist perspectives versus the pluralists. And if you did sociology, you might have come up, or politics, you might have come up with these terms. Anybody ever heard these terms before in your first year studies? Sociology. Sociology, correct. They would hear about pluralism and thing in sociology. So that also is relevant to HR, as I said. So you have the unions that were in control of labor, Back in those early industrial revolution times, early 1900s, and then HRM now is coming to sway, and unions see them as being anti-union, 
they don't have, have a pro management agenda, right? So that's the context under which HR actually developed for management to gain more power over workers. Because you had some very, very powerful union um, back in those days. So you have what we call the unitarist perspective, where employees and the employer share, that's what it says, share these common goals. And conflict is not normal. That's what they said. Now, it is different to the pluralist perspective, which says conflict is a normal thing. So since conflict is a normal thing, it will always exist in the workplace, and that the right and that the rights of the workers or the the goals and the ambitions of workers will always be different from those from management. Right? Um, different interests, different goals. So this one is saying we are one. Management and workers share common goals. Right? We have the same aims. The pluralists are saying no, no. The employer is the employer. And the employees are employees. They have these different perspectives and goals. Um, hence, conflict will be occurring. And since conflict will be a normal thing, you need unions to protect the workers against these employers who got their own goals. This is so divided. HR may say, no, 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 we are one happy family. That's only the unitarist. So HR was formed on a unitarist philosophical perspective and trade unionism under the pluralist. So like any ism, depending which school you subscribe to, you will fit in either to the union bank or the HRN bank. So as students, you might have your own perspectives. If you are an employee, you might see the pluralist perspective. If you are part of management, you might actually see this perspective too. If you own your own business, you're likely to see this, that you want to get rid of conflict, right? You want to reduce conflict to a minimum so that you don't have to have unions coming in to solve problems for you, right? So this is really the whole, the, 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 um, the philosophical premise, premises and the environment that led to the development of HRA. And this is where a lot of unions up to today argue that HRN is an employer thing to weaken unions and take advantage of workers. Right? That's what unions still argue. So they're, they're very skeptical about HR managers. And there's still some great some tensions. When I was president of the Human Resource Management Association of Barbados, if I had actually gone to Grenada, right, I think I'd gone, when I was serving, I went to Grenada, I think St. Lucia, to assist those two countries in setting up their HR, national HR associations. I know there's one in Jamaica, one in Trinidad, right? Trinidad's HR, her map was pretty big, right? The Human Resource Management Association of Trinidad and Tobago. There was a guy who I know, Amos Hirai, you, you don't know that name? He used to be the director of HR at Hilton for a while. But I think he went, went to some other big hotel group. But the Trinidad HR Association was a very strong and powerful association. So I want you to be familiar with these two perspectives because sometimes I test you in the exam on them. The unitarist, unitarist perspective, which was part of the evolution of the HR, and the pluralist, which was the foundation for trade unionism and the, works, the rights of workers being different from the, um, that of the employer. And as I have here, very important concepts. So I'll give you a few definitions for HRM. This is one that I um, developed some years ago. Yeah, HRM is an externally and internally driven activity that utilizes various styles of managing and leading people, um, both collectively and individually, as a means of improving performance, particularly in the area of service excellence, um, which involves manager, line managers. So I think service excellence for me all they do is to provide service to human beings. So there's no other reason why businesses exist. 
right? A business is not self-serving. In other words, you don't just set up a business because you want to set up a business. Anytime you set up a business, that business is set up to serve who? People. There's no business that just set up to set up say. I don't have the money to waste. So for me, service is actually the essence of forming any business. Which begs the question, why do so many people not pay attention then to quality of service? So how would you assess the quality of service of the university in terms of teaching? On a scale of one to ten, how would you rate that? Truthfully, oh, truthfully of course. Scale of one to ten, quality of teaching in UE. Abiola. This is my first um, semester, so I can't really judge. Yes. You're a week young, two weeks young. <laughs> Are you giving me good grades from the professors I've had so far? Eight. Okay. A three. Oh, jeez. <laughs> 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 Tara, three or two, seven. seven. How much you would get? Me? Well, again, people might have different experiences. You see. What? How would you rate the quality of service by the admin people in the main building? <laughs> At zero. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we have we need to improve there really, really seriously. Sorry. But the, um, but there are challenges in terms of service. Even internally, us going for service. So I don't. But you're not service oriented, you know, to deliver service. Even though I think they try to train people, right? But in terms of the manner and the, the facial expression, you know, students are interruptions. That's you know, cultural. Yeah, it's, but it's cultural, right? Cultural. So your interruption for the visual work they're doing. Why well, all students come to bother us? Right? But philosophically, there's only reason why you have a job, students. But some people are so much into their technical work that they see students as interruptions and this important work they're doing to serve students, right? So, but it's something that needs to change. But if you go to international universities, it's a totally different you know, thing. They go, because they know that they want your money, so they go out of their way to provide excellent service, you see? Um, so that's what I'm saying here. Service excellence is really the pinnacle. But again, I think we talk about Barbados, but you know, all you need to do is to go to TNT, the gas station, public bus. All you need to do is go in any public or private space, and you can see the, 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 the issues of violence, somebody, but mainly, really, very, I would say, very poor standards of service. You know, how people don't want the things that I, 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 well, I can speak about Barbados, but one of the things I hate, 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 right? I go into a place, I'm buying something. And you find the phone. Mm. Yes, uh huh. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was asking, are your colleagues there? You talking to your colleagues? Yeah, uh huh. And, um, yeah. You're serving me. So if you're serving me, give me 100% attention. And when I'm gone, you can talk. But people talking to their friends, you know, in the supermarket, they're on their phones and they're transacting, and they serve you, and they even say thank you. They go on to the next person. Before the word being said, but that's a normal thing in Barbados today. Normal, 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 normal. Right? So it's becoming part of the culture, you know, and it's okay. So if you tell them anything, they get vexed. You know, for me, if I encounter somebody who is not giving me 100%, I usually say, I usually say things like, but you're not smiling. You're supposed to smile with me. I know what the standards are here. I know what they expect of you. So I need to see that smile. Sometimes they may smile, but the attitude may change. Then I would yeah, say, but you have change. to speak with me differently. So I say things yeah. to let them know that this is it's what wrong. I should really. It's wrong. So I don't try to be rude or anything. I just tell them, look, 
So when I say when I say smile, because there's a nice day, I say something nice to them too, and then the attitude you can see a difference in the attitude after that. Yeah. Um, but some take and some get annoyed. Who the hell do you think you are? Yeah. But and, and the more annoyed you get, the more the sweeter you have to be <laughs> So you have That's to nice. get you right through. You've got to get you right through. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but it, but you see, but it's poor leadership and management or supervision because if you had people really monitoring and supervising, they would realize this this is not a really good attitude, you see. Um, but, but it, sorry, are not any different. Yeah, but, but I remember, but I remember years. But this is the old time days. I remember back in the uh, when I was that was be somewhere back in like the seventies. That was in the seventies when it was a radical that time. I remember I went to, it was a Chafet, I think on the second, it was the second Chafet that was down Harbour Road. Mm-hmm. But it was a Chafet that was down Harbour Road. I think it was the second one or the third one. Mm-hmm. And we had gone to the cinema, we went out there to, to buy some Chafet. And the same thing, for service, and I complained, I said, I want the supervisor, but the supervisor was busy in the back, chatting with the girls and, you know, maybe flirting with them. So when he came out, I said, listen, you should know better as a supervisor. You know, look how you did behaving with the staff. You're not better than that. <laughs> that time, my mom, my mom wrote me say, "Come outside now! Come outside now!" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this little boy's up. Come on! And that time, my sister frightened out. She shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. My sister frightened out. But yeah, she went outside too. My roll. She says, "I went outside because you think I'm muscular, right?" We outside with the doors all up, puffing. <laughs> hey, super boy, sir. Let me come outside and roll. You see this. But that thing had the cameras on it, and stuff. I, I would never forget that. I mean, don't say I'm busy, you know, that my sister not blocking and holding me and driving me out. Oh gosh, listen, but <laughs> only in the Caribbean, huh? No? <laughs> only in the Caribbean. We have a lovely place we live in. <laughs> uh, so this is another definition. Right? Policies, practices, and systems that influence employees' behavior, attitude, and performance. So again, from our experience, you know the issue of policies, practices, and what you do. Policy is some kind of policy pertaining maybe the same thing we're talking about. What's your policy in helping customers resolve problems? What's your policy related to how you serve customers? What's your policy in getting back to a customer? So what's the policy for students? When you ask students, when students come to make a query, what's the policy in getting back to students? Is it that you must get back to students in a week? Uh, or people just don't get back to students. You have to come back when you don't hear anybody, you see. Um, to influence employees' behavior, what you're talking about, attitude and performance. So what you're talking about is an attitude. The vex with somebody, so you've got to feel the vexness. You know? What about the behavior? You know? So this even happens in something you wouldn't expect in a hospital that you would find very unpleasant nurses, but they are unpleasant nurses at the hospital. Mm-hmm. You know, and the patient is very sick, you are there with somebody very sick, and when you have very sick relatives, sometimes you get nervous, you get annoyed, and you go there, you're upset about something, and the nurses will give you a brass enough. You know, how dare you ask us those kind of questions? But it's just that the family member might be just going through a lot of pain, <laughs> you know. But so, so this thing about behaviors and attitude is a very powerful thing. But is it easy for people to change behaviors and attitudes? No. If you've been doing it for a long, long time, it's really, really difficult to change the behaviors. And as you say, when it comes part of the organizational culture, you've got a lot of problems. So HR intends really to address these issues, helping employees to have the appropriate behaviors and the appropriate attitudes that can enhance performance. Now, the other things I want you to share with you this evening would be the philosophy governing HRN and how it differs from personnel management, right? So, so they said personnel management was the old approach all back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s where people were just seen as, as, as um, beings to do work in a production plant. So it's important for you as students of HRN to understand the philosophy that informed the practice. So what we're seeing here, the, the main philosophy that guides HR it, um, people as a critical resource to be developed for future benefit to the organization, right? as a critical resource. 
So when you have a critical resource, what do you do with resources that are critical and important? Sorry? You value them. You keep them. Right? So when an organization is going through difficult financial times, it doesn't look for its core assets and get rid of them, the physical assets. You try to keep your physical assets. You might sell off the old building, but you keep the ones that are worthwhile. So, but what do you do with your human resources? Are there important assets you try to keep also? So, we're saying it's a resource to be invested in and sharing responsibility and decision making. So that's the HR philosophy, which is juxtaposed to the personnel management philosophy, which is people in the organization are perceived or treated as expenses to be controlled to ensure profitability. Right? And then we are saying it's operational. So I control expenses. You understand? When your expenses are too high, you try to cut them. So if HR is seen as an expense, when times become difficult, you cut your expenses. But if they were truly seen as resources, it's not one of the first things you would cut. You would probably try to trim other areas. And I can give you an example of a real life company that unfortunately not in the Caribbean that followed this. And it was the Southwest Airlines. Everybody here familiar with Southwest Airlines, right? It's really an inland United States airline. It doesn't travel outside of the US. But it's one of the most profitable and most successful airlines in the U.S., operating within the U.S. And back in the 90s, early 90s, or 80s, I don't know, there was a serious oil crisis. Right? And all the Caribbean islands and countries around the world would have gone through challenges. So once oil rises, you know the major challenge for airlines, because planes run on fuel. So there was a major challenge for airlines all across the world, and a number of them collapsed. And so for airlines, like any other airline, had to make a decision on how are they going to deal with the rising costs and the rising expenses for running a plane, um, a fleet of, of, air, of planes. So what do you think they did? Sorry? No. Cut. The distance in flight or something? Planes. They, they, made, they had made a philosophical commitment to staff that in difficult times, the staff would be the last thing that they would cut. And, this, and the presidents said that. They cut the instruments. So what they did, what they did, they basically got rid of some planes, sold some planes, you know, want to get money. And then they told the staff, this is the commitment we made to you. What's your commitment? So staff then, so obviously when you get rid of a plane or two, you have less machines. So when they told the staff, what are you going to do now to contribute? We are not getting rid of you. So staff volunteered to put in double time to fill the roofs with the same amount of planes. That's what they did. Staff volunteered to work extra time without money so that the planes would fly longer times, and the staff did it before money, but they kept their jobs. Because that time, other airlines were cutting staff by the thousands. But you see the different philosophical premise. Mm -hmm. So the company benefited, because to sell two planes means that you'll cut your fleet. But they just doubled up routes. But the planes that left, and the staff did the flights, all pilots and the air hostesses and the office staff, before any additional money. You see? So that's what you call a commitment to a child's philosophical premise. Now it's a big decision for board and event to the level of the board. It's a big decision to make to sell two planes. Now how many airlines, how many companies would be agreed to sell equipment to keep staff? And then ask the staff, what are you going to do to help us now? We sold equipment, but we still got the work to do. Are you prepared to double up? Uh, so, air, so, so first really start, stood out and still stands out as a company that really is heavily committed to its staff. So there's a lot of case studies written on Southwest. A lot of, because uh, they, they didn't talk HR, they practiced HR. You remember you talk about the prescriptive versus descriptive? That was a company that Harvard and Ivy and all of those have a lot of, in fact, you can go on Ivy and look and you will see a number of cases about Southwest Airlines. And if you see the promotions that they do, and they can tell the staff are having fun, all kind of weird things they do. Because that's a culture, family culture. We care about you. And the message they're sending to staff 
we truly care about you as people, and we prefer to sell planes than to get rid of staff for us, which is a very powerful statement. So then after that, I mean, the profitability went up after they got into the oil crisis because staff were so committed that the board and top management could make such a decision to prefer to keep their jobs and sell two planes or so to make the money. That's a very powerful statement to make, you see. Um, so it goes back to the point I mentioned, are you philosophically committed to people as a resource that you keep? Or are you into the personal management philosophy where we have to cut staff? You don't have to cut staff. You can find alternative creative ways to reduce costs and just invite staff to share in the process. And that's what I said here in decision making. Right? Because once they sold the planes, they went to staff and said, what are you prepared to do? Two planes short means we are not going to be able to provide the routes. What are you prepared to do? And the staff came up with a suggestion of doing extra time without pay so the planes would, would, would do additional work to cover the routes that would be short with the planes missing. So they would be doing longer hours, longer days, longer weeks. So I want to show now the objectives of HRM. There are a number of objectives established by HRM. And we have, this is where your psychology will come in. Job satisfaction, self-actualization and motivation. Which theory, talk, which theory talks about self-actualization? Maslow. Maslow, the hierarchy of needs. So we're saying in HR, philosophically, you should help people to self-actualize and achieve their full potential. Right? Well, many organizations really can't say this, but there are some of the more financially feasible ones. Employ effectiveness versus efficiency. So how do you distinguish effectiveness from efficiency? Somebody right in the back, how does effectiveness differ from efficiency? My IT friend in the, the white shirt. What's your name? Thomas. Thomas. So tell me, how does effectiveness differ from efficiency? These two phrases you should know from time to time. In fact, the one or two of your exam questions will have issues of effectiveness and efficiency. Anybody? What is good when one gets the job done well? Efficiency. Right, so efficient, so effectiveness, so I would I would add it further than just getting the job done. Um, I would say meeting your targets. Right? You have met your target. Efficiency now would be, did you go over the budget and meet the target? So the target might be to complete this job by January 18th. But did you overspend? Did you use more resources than originally budgeted? So you complete the job, you got it done, but it was so expensive. Did the company benefit? No, we lost. You understand? So it's, it's possible to complete your job, but the company comes up with a loss, and that's not good business. You need to complete it, but in the most efficient way that you can still have some profits. So, so this is achieving your goals. This is the cost, the quality, Right? and the human resources utilized within it. So when I'm efficient, I am mindful of the resources I'm utilizing, especially the financial resource. Improve quality, innovation and creativity, cost effectiveness and competitiveness, and labor flexibility. You want labor that, is, that can solve best. People are flexible, that can you know, perform different roles. Some other objectives are employee commitment. Sorry. Employee commitment to the organization. Can we assume that so far staff members were highly committed thereafter? Increased competence through training and development, participation and autonomy, and creating readiness for change. And this one. And this, these two are becoming very popular today. Where 
um, people are saying, look, we are intelligent, we have brains. I went and did my master's degree, so why are you micromanaging me? Why don't you give me the autonomy to do my job and make decisions? So a lot of workers today are saying, we want autonomy. Don't be giving us instructions and telling us what to do, do this, do that. But after a while, if you're an intelligent person, you get frustrated. You may pay you a lot of money, but I'm not using my brain. I'm just some routine thing I'm doing and taking instructions. So for me, I can't work in such an environment. Right? That would kill me dead, 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 dead. Other people can do that. Depends. It's about your temperament and personality. And then rewards and incentives linked to, this is becoming very popular, we're going to deal with this one in the first semester, but the issue of um, time-based pay versus what? Time-based pay versus performance-based pay. So most workers in the Caribbean are paid based on time. If you're monthly, I have worked for four weeks, 40 hour a week. If you're weekly, you get already paid. I've done all of my hours, eight hours a day, by five days, give me my weekly wage. For the monthly people, I came to work all the days. But did you do your job? How were you always on the internet, wasting time, two hour lunches, 45 minute break, finish in 10 minutes. So performance-based pay says you are paid based on performance. So if you don't perform, you're not paid. A lot of people don't like that. But it's fair. Because if I'm working harder than you, you shouldn't get the same pay as me. If you sure work, why do you get the same pay as me? A man management wants somebody to do it better, they come to me and you sure. But at the end of the month, you know, you, but you know workers say, but workers who work hard. And then you can use a for the same salary mm -hmm. in the mouth. And people say that, you know. <laughs> you can use that for You can get the same salary. You want the management favorite? Mm -hmm. You understand you know what you're talking about? And that, some people take that attitude and they verbalize it. But I ain't killing myself, man. Yeah. I appointed. Mm -hmm. The government, they love that word, boy. I know some people get appointed. Boy, you ain't appointed, boy. I got this by permanent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people celebrate because they're permanent. Me, I get appointed in government. I get appointed in the IT stage. Because, boy, I got the thing, boy, I appointed. Ford can't touch me now. <laughs> this boy, I will Ford. I will Ford can't touch me now, boy. I got the letter. I permanent. <laughs> so, when you're permanent, you can say, boy, let me chill out today. But no, fella, I can stay for two hour lunch. Boy, appointed. Actually, I'll go on to the Governor General. <laughs> but you know this is you. Mm -hmm. And then the fella said, uh, November, you know, I got 15 sick days yeah, left. I got, uh, I got to take my sick days before you know my sick days. Yeah. Sick days. <laughs> two weeks, two days this week, two days the next week. Skip three. <laughs> so I'm taking my sick days, boy. I'm taking me two days. And we got 21 in Barbados, right? <laughs> It's 21 sick days in public, in public service. You, you know it's 21 uncertified days, uncertified sick days. In two, the days of two, so you take two. You don't want to go to the doctor, two days, and another two days, and another two days, and another two days. Oh my gosh, boy. Wow. Wow. Extra vacation. What's extra vacation? And people actually say, you, we well, got 10 sick days there. <laughs> And, and but, but we'll get people say they can lose it. They can lose it. You are sick. You're losing it. But that's the culture. <laughs> you, you got twenty one sick days. I, and then I think to some extent the union supports it too. You know the union will come out and tell them don't do it. It's wrong. You need to stop it, right? So um, so I mean when they worked in the public sector, it was quite amazing to me. But and I, I was all back in the seventies and eighties. I worked in the government. Um, wow, it was amazing, and it's still there. So you picture up about 25,000 workers in the public sector, that 20% of those taking out these sick days. Uh, you know how many hours are lost? You know how many hours are lost? I mean, that's phenomenal, right? So, but this seeks to address it, linking rewards, but again, culturally, 
this wouldn't fly. I don't think the politicians would be brave enough to pass something like this here to link public sector pay to performance. Yes. Um, just, just a question. Um, so if, if you're entitled to 21 sick days, um, we can assume that they already budgeted that far, right? <laughs> He's so, he's so, he's so, he's so, but you hear me say, it's 21 sick days. What do you want, sir? It's sick days. So it's, it's supposed to be taken if, for some reason, you are, you are sick for a day or you're sick for the second day. Because if you're sick for the third day, you're going to go to the doctor. Right? So if every month you have just happen to be sick for two days, it seems quite curious. So it's really for people who, for some reason, got a, a you know, Maybe ladies, they might have that time in the month, and if some people have difficulty, but it's really not intended that you just take them up. For their sick days, they're not low days or days off, right? So um, the, but we know it's part of the culture. Nobody really challenges it. Nobody questions it because, as you say, legally, and you're correct, legally you can take your 21 days in for two days or the one days, and nobody can tell you anything. The only thing is that if you're supposed to be sick. And you see you're working for somebody else, or you know, nobody beach playing cricket and football. That's the only other thing. But again, I think even in the public service, if somebody saw you doing that, nobody really ain't gonna do anything either. You see. And some people might be bold enough to see the supervisor and you talk, say, oh, what's happening? <laughs> I hear lightning. <laughs> Yeah, there's really that is that's the really thing. But maybe I don't know if our culture in the Caribbean, as I said before, um, it's not taken off in the Caribbean at all, performance-related pay. But there are certain professions, actually, who do it. You can tell me this, like insurance agents, for a decade, have been under performance-related pay. They get the small base pay, but their salary every month is contingent upon them bringing in policies and converting them to real dollars. Yeah. No more. Some of the private, it's growing on the private sector. It's now becoming more popular in the private sector. I think the financial services sector is now going more so in this direction, but it's not widespread really, you see. But the insurance agents have been like that, you know, people working with real estate on commissions and sales. So a lot of sales environments, people have been on that for decades, performance-related pay, but it's slowly coming in, right? Slowly, slowly coming in. Uh, more organic structures, if you go back to management, organic means flexible, very flexible, not very bureaucratic, not very rigid, that they can change easily, and um, recognizing human resource issues at the highest level, which is strategic HRM. So we're trying to say HR should be considered when you're making your big decisions for investment, for expansion. So there should be some HR person, even at the level of the board, advising management. So the last thing I want to share with you would be today is the um, remember, you're doing just a foundational stuff on sharing things with you to set a platform. Um, there are five key phases we say that are exist in HR, and a number of core functions that fall within these phases. Right. So I would like you to learn them well by next week. You know, you should know them generally, but you need to know these five phases and the functions that come under, under each phase, and that would be the structure. The course really is structured, structured according to these phases and functions. Just a question, the books are, are in line with the books, right? I, here, I'm not sure. Yeah. No. They're there. They're there. Okay. Me too. Because when I asked Monica Smith, she told me to check the bookshop. So you have your text? Yeah, I have it. Okay. It's both back and right, back and forth, yeah. And that's, I find that's a very user friendly, usable text. Yeah, a pretty good text, yeah, Bratton and Gold. So please get hold of the text and start pushing some work. But remember, folks, what I do during the weeks is to give you guides, right? I give you guides to show you where you can focus. And what I'm doing today is to highlight some key points, some critical foundational points some concepts and um, theories that you should be aware of as you begin to read and as we really go into the the real HR stuff that you would get in the exam. So this is one that, as I said, before we get into looking at the core subject matter, you need to be able to see the, to conceptualize the structure of HR. And HR is structured according to these phases and functions. If you don't know that, you're going to have challenges as we go ahead and we start to integrate. You're going to have some challenges in understanding. So please treat it as a foundation thing that by next week, 
if I come and say one of the five phases, you should be able to say the environmental scanning, the acquisition phase, the development phase, the motivation phase, and maintenance and retention. Right, so we say the first is continuous environmental scanning and analysis. As we began, you scan the environment, what are the factors, are there environmental issues, are there new laws, new procedures, new economic policies, what, are, what changes are happening in the country, you see. Um, so one of the things that would have happened in the Caribbean, the social and cultural changes, that if you had to go back, well, this is 2017, if you had to go back about 40 years, you know, you hardly, you would hardly find few women doctors, few women lawyers, few women engineers, right? Few women in technology, few women teaching at the university. If you went back 40 years, you would hardly find women in those positions, right? Few women driving buses. Few women driving minibuses, or none. I know, I know in the 70s then there was one young girl that used to drive minibus, and unfortunately she died. Huh? Oh, yeah. Correct, when she died, when the bus fell on her. She was the only lady, a very a, a tiny little thing, man, but drive that bus, I mean, who knows something else? Have one of the biggest buses. And when you see her driving, young girl in her 20s, but then one day she was fixing the bus, and unfortunately had it propped on something, and her mini, it was her minibus, it fell on her and crushed her. And she died where she was really unfortunate. But she was a pioneer woman, a young girl. I mean, everybody knew her at that time because she was the only woman driving a minibus. Mm -hmm. And driving it, I mean, really driving it extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a major change, you know, women. And so now you've got so many women doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants. 40 years ago, most accountants, qualified accountants were men. Now, you know, I'm sure more women are qualified in accounting than men. Engineering, medicine, law, more women are graduated. So that's a major and significant change that has happened in, in, in the Caribbean. Major. In the police force, you hardly, how many women would have had a rank sister at that time in the police force 40 years ago? Maybe one. Army. Women in the army, they were maids and cleaners, but women in the army at any rank. So, so we have had significant and fundamental change for women's rights in the Caribbean over, of course, there's still things to be done, but if you look at what has been achieved, you know, women who own their cars and own their houses, who own their lives, right, that's a significant change, right? So we have a high-ranking officer here among you who's, uh, again, a, a, a lady. Um, so we are saying those things have impacted on HR because the culture of the workplace was very male-dominated 40 years ago. So all the CEOs and general managers and top managers, if you go into financial services now, you have so many women in senior position, even in the government, so many women. In fact, 40 years ago, I doubt you had any females that were PSs and DPSs, or anybody even one or two. But now you've got so many females here in Barbados who are PSs and DPSs. If you look around the Caribbean, female politicians, hardly in that time you had females in, in, you know, in young people in St. Lucia, Dominica, Jamaica. You have women, young women coming forward and getting involved in politics. Now that is going to change the nature, or has been changing the nature of HR. So in fact, maybe 80% or more of HR practitioners are actually female, right? Very few men are involved in HR practice at the higher level. Right? So even that practice is a female dominated area right now. So when you go to the HR association, most of the persons holding office in the HR association are actually women and very few men. And then at the university, most of the students, in fact, this class is the abnormal, because you've got four men, but normally you only have one. So you, you, this is a record to have so many men in one of my classes, in master's classes, you hardly see men. And for those who did the program, you hardly see men in the master's program. Right? So, these, so, you, so I'm saying the change would be when you want people with higher qualification going into the workplace, both public and private, you're going to find now that there are greater opportunities if you want people, if you're selecting based on qualifications and capability, you're going to find women will be much better placed for those positions. So my prediction, I'm very positive of it. I, I can tell you my prediction is, gentlemen, in the next 20 years, that the majority of CEOs in private sector firms will be women, Chairman of boards will be women. 
right? Women will dominate medicine, engineering, science, technology, um, HR. Women will dominate all major professions, law. In 20 years, all, I mean all. Was that? <laughs> was that? And he would be. I say, hold that. But there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? So there's nothing wrong with that. If, if the lady is working for enough money and you have young children, and because um, I know people that do that. You know, I know, there's a friend I know that the wife was the biggest, was a bigger breadwinner, and they had young children, and the dad was the person that stayed home and took care of the children. So there's nothing wrong with that. You know, so, once you and the, and, the, and the lady, once you know who the boss in the house. <laughs> Never. That's good advice, You're right? So once you know who the boss in the house, everything will be okay. <laughs> but I'm serious, folks. So if I predict in 20 years. You would actually have women, even in police force, you're going to have women in very, very dominant and powerful positions throughout the Caribbean. So acquisition, HR planning. So these are the topics we'll actually touch on. So when we look at HR planning, recruitment and selection and orientation and socialization is going to be under the acquisition phase. Right? So I might ask a question. Um, um, explain or illustrate the kinds of activities a company planning to expand in the Caribbean by engaging in the acquisition phase. We need to know what HR functions are covered. So I'm separating phases from functions. So these are the phases, acquisition, these are the functions. So the functions are the things that are done by the HR professional. Then we have the development phase, which involves training of employees, employee motivation, and career development. That's the development phase. You're developing employee skills and developing their capabilities and competencies. And then the motivation phase, where you are putting incentives in place to get people inspired. So this is where a lot of the motivational theories would come in. So even within HR, for those who did psychology, we actually Implement, we actually you, uh, refer to a number of motivational theories. So I can tell you right now, one of the things you would need to go and refresh your memory on, that's all students, would be those motivational, the motivational um, theories. Um, more so expectancy theory, Maslow's, and Herzberg's. Right? Herzberg's two factor theory and goal setting theory. So you have job design how jobs are designed to be more efficient, um, the performance appraisal, and I would, more, I would broaden it to look at performance management, rewards and compensation, job evaluation, and issues of discipline. Um, so those functions fall under motivation. Uh, so remember the phase, if you go back again, you would have the first phase is that of environmental scanning, followed by acquisition phase, and the functions under it, followed by development, and the functions under it, the three functions, then motivation, and the functions of appraisal, compensation, evaluation, job design, and then maintenance and retention is the final phase, and under maintenance and retention, we have um, employee relations, employee health and safety, and we also have commitment there. And we know employee health and safety um, is very big across organizations today, and when you look at the Caribbean, where we have so a very high incidence of non-communicable diseases, the obesity is becoming a major problem in the Caribbean, uh, high blood pressure, uh, stroke, heart attack, diabetes, and the complications of diabetes is becoming a major problem. And with the age of fast food and changing diets, a lot of the younger generation now in their teens and down will be really, really exposed to very challenging some serious health challenges in the future. Uh, why is that important? From the HR perspective, that a lot of the youth um, are not, in terms of health, not becoming obese and having type 1 and 2 diabetes at a young age. What's the challenge for HR? Sickness. We're talking to the young teenagers. Well, mothers in the workplace are 
Yes. Anything else? Why would you want to be concerned about the young teenagers and your no, that's your Because in the next, if you are fifth, if you are sixteen, you could be working in four years. So these people actually, in the next ten to fifteen years, become part of the workforce. And if they enter the workforce with, with such with worse health than their parents, we got a major problem because. These diseases can be debilitating. And I hope you'll be monitoring the trend in the Caribbean. And it's not about being slim. You've got a lot of slim people with serious cholesterol problems, blood pressure problems, heart problems. At least they don't talk about the diabetes. Once you get diabetes, everything else fails. Diabetes will affect your heart, all your vital organs, your limbs, your eyes. So once you get diabetes and it's out of control, and unfortunately for us Caribbean people, we like to be determined when I got sugar in the family. <laughs> but my father died from diabetes too. Like if diabetes is something that we have a right to. <laughs> <laughs> but that's when people talk about it, over sugar in the family. I hear, I hear educated people telling me that, you know, oh, it's not sugar in our family. Like if you have a, it's in the family, so I, I wait until I get it. And they actually wait, I mean, but literally, not really, really way. The way you have your lifestyle. Um, so I'm very aware. My dad died of complications of diabetes. He was going blind, and then he had his heart was damaged, and he had a massive heart attack. He died. Then my younger brother developed diabetes. So I say, you know something? I have no right to diabetes. So, so I'm very conscious of my sugar levels and things like that. So last year I had an I had a, a, a minor medical procedure and after my my sugar levels spiked and I went into panic. I said, Lord, diabetes. But I suppose just maybe the shock of the, the operation and then um, the maybe I know maybe the body offset, but for some reason my, my levels spiked. But the first thing I thought about, don't tell me I'm gonna be the third family person in the family with diabetes. So, but then the doctor said, oh, don't worry about it, just monitor. And then when I did a test about three or four weeks after, the levels came back down to normal. But because of that, I'm so much more aware now, you see. So I, I was never really a sweet drink person or sugar. I do my teeth before. But right now, I go on the, I really extreme with it. I just eliminate sugar products. I don't care if you tell me natural juice. When they look at it and I see it got sugar in it, I say, say I'm not drinking it. Right? Uh, but I'm saying the challenge for EHR in the future, this is a major issue, folks. Right? A lot of, even with, with the blood pressure, there are a lot of serious, uh, it's a major problem throughout the Caribbean. Now, you all know the problem, gentlemen, with the problem with men with high blood pressure. It's Important. a cultural thing. That's it. Important. And they don't want to take any medication. Mm -hmm. So because they're taking the medication, then, the heart, the heart, you look guilty, you know. Me? <laughs> <laughs> Exercise a lot. Exercise a lot. But folks, there's a serious issue because the problem with high blood pressure for men, the medication creates problems elsewhere. Yeah. And because of that, they don't take the medication. And because they don't, look at Amiola laughing. And because they don't take the medication, <laughs> and because they don't take the medication, you know what blood pressure causes? The, the problem with high blood pressure is not the constant rise, it, it's that when it spikes. So when it spikes, the heart is like the heart is a muscle. So all that happens, the heart begins to develop muscles and the heart gets harder. And over years, when it spikes, you say, oh, well, my pressure is just spike every once in a while. That's the dangerous one. So eventually, your heart muscles in trouble, the muscles harden, and then one day you just drop down with some heart attack or you're developing heart problems and once the heart ain't working you could have well taken medication but the same thing will happen. Some men some men probably view it as as a death. But they prefer that you're correct by saying culture they prefer to die some men will tell you that I prefer to die first but they end up dying actually because they don't take the medication and they get strokes, heart attacks. It's a real serious culture for men in the Caribbean. I got some friends refuse to take the medication. Right. But it's a cultural thing, as you say, in memory history, I prefer to dead than for that to happen to me. Right. But it's something we need to overcome. 
right? But again, we, I think the, the doctors might be saying the, it might be a genetic thing because of the African um, heritage or whatever, but you know, high blood pressure is a problem in the region, and all of these non-communicable diseases will create problems for us in the future. And it's a cause, actually. It's actually a serious cause to the healthcare system, right? Um, and it's throughout the Caribbean. It's not only a Barbados problem. It's a serious Caribbean problem. We have one, some of the highest rates in the world. Very, very high rates, you see. And I can tell you, my, I have a very close friend. Uh, we were both ill last year. But unfortunately for me, I just... I had two medical procedures, and uh, within about three months, I was well. But he was super fit. I mean, super fit. Sixties, early sixties, mid sixties, super fit. I mean, man, trim, swim. He would swim all past the, the boys. Swim about two hours every, almost every evening. Volleyball. No oil. No fat. No grease. No sugar. But you know the problem with him was he, he, he had a no he had a genetic problem with cholesterol and he was trying to treat it naturally but it was a genetic problem so natural foods all that thing and so be, you understand and then the family after the brothers you know got tested and realized all of them had cholesterol because it's a genetic thing in the family so he was all easier just trying to control it and then one day the, the levels were spiking and clog up all of the main arteries going to the brain so he had a massive stroke major brain damage, then he had heart failure, and he was in a coma from my close personal friend. He was in a coma from June 24th until now with massive brain damage and on vent. He's on every, he does on machines there, like a log. You imagine? Super fit. So, just, so, so what I'm saying to you with these non-communicable diseases like that, it, his cholesterol was just out of control, genetically. So he just needed to be medicated. But his view was, I was going to use natural, a natural remedy to exercise and diet to control it. Right? And he didn't. And he had a nursing background, so he was of the view he knew what to do. And you know all the things that uh, he knew what to do when he was the uh, self-treatment. It's a really sad story. My personal, personal friend, I can't even go look at him now. You know, it's been eight months, nine, been about nine, ten months now. And, you know, brain just body, body damage. So it's really little. It's just there like a lot of ventilate and every machine and things. So I think it's really difficult for me to go look for him. Right? And everybody is having family, but we knew him as a health freak. So the point I make to you folks is the one of the biggest challenges for the attorney Caribbean is really health and safety now. Right? Serious. Well, apart from the youngsters shooting up themselves with guns and everything, right? Um, the, you heard they said some first murder for the year in Barbados, some youngster 20 years old. I know they're looking for the for work for you all for. <laughs> right. But apart from that, is is these diseases that would have substantial costs to organizations. They mean substantial costs when people have to be aware of leave. So if you are sick constantly, you got to bring in. You can't fire the person because the person actually has a serious medical problem. You know, so many people are away from work, and then you go into the hospital and public care, private care. You talk about multi, multi million dollars every year. Which I haven't even told y'all. Like, do y'all know also that kidney failure is becoming a serious problem in the Caribbean? Yes. Renal failure. Yes. People, kidneys failing. And you have to go on dialysis to the rest of your life. It's a major problem in the Caribbean, and Barbados is a major problem. Kidney failure. And it's overwhelming. The, the medical system, yeah. Right now, the, 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 the kidney unit at the hospital is beaming over. They don't have enough space for people. In fact, they expanded it about eight years ago or nine years ago. They expanded it nine years ago, Abiola, and it's still not big enough for the amount of people who are having kidney failure throughout the country. But it's a Caribbean issue. And I've been talking about the cancer. So folks, we have some, I, I, we have our societies, for some reason, we have our societies that are very sick. You know, the cancers, the ladies, uh, ladies with the cancers that are, are already taken out. Up to last week, somebody told me a young lady, 30s, cancer, breast cancer, uterine cancer, all types of cancer. Even the rare cancer that David Thompson died with, the problem here, the, um, the 
pancreatic cancer is a very rare cancer. You have a number of people in Barbados dying from pancreatic cancer, and it's one of the most rare cancers you could find across the world. Right? A number of people are dying from it here. Which, you know. So it's going to be something in these tiny islands why we have these chronic things that somebody has to research it to find out. Because as you said, it's going to impact on our work. It not it is going to, it is impacting on our workplaces. What I'll do, I will bring, we have actually some statistics on absence, because I'm chairman of the Productivity Council. And we published a year report on one of the biggest challenges in the hotel sector actually, significant absence 